And before we get underway, I do have just a brief little sponsor note. All of these free sessions that I offer every month come with a sponsor, and this month it's Ingram Spark. So I am actually a customer of Ingram. I use Ingram to distribute uh, my self-published titles. Uh, if you're curious about Ingram Spark and would like to see the services they offer, uh, just take note of the link there or take a picture of the QR code. Uh, if you're ready to publish immediately, they are sharing a code for free distribution if you use the code BOOKLOVE. Uh, uh, insider tip, they almost always have a free code available for uploading your book for free. So when this one expires at the end of February, just go Googling and you'll find the one that's for March, uh, I'm pretty sure. But anyway, thank you to Ingram Spark. I appreciate your support. All right, so a little bit about Allison and Brady. I'm sure you're gonna find out much more from them directly as we go. But just as a, a few brief notes as we get underway, they write together as um, Ali Brady. They each have their own author careers and then they have this joint co-authorship career. The first novel under this name appeared in June, 2022, The Beach Trap. And then their second novel, under this name will release in May from Penguin Random House. And I, I've now forgotten the imprint that you guys are under. What imprint is it? Berkeley. 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 Thank you. Okay, so just a little bit about this upcoming book. It's called The Comeback Summer. Uh, it falls under women's fiction or contemporary romance, uh, May 9th, uh, $17 paperback original, plus there's gonna be an ebook and an audiobook edition. Do I have, I just wanna make sure I've got that right, yes? Yep. Okay, good. And then I'll just read the brief description. So we're all on the same page about what this book is about. Uh, sisters Hannah and Libby need a miracle. The PR agency they inherited from their grandmother is losing clients left and right, and they are devastated at the thought of closing. The situation seems hopeless until in walks Lou, an eccentric self-help guru who is looking for a new PR agency. Her business could solve all their problems, but there's a catch. Whoever works with Lou must complete a 12-week challenge as part of her Crush Your Comfort Zone program. Um, do you, is there anything else you want to mention in particular about this book? It's set, it's set in Chicago, uh, which I think will come up later as perhaps important to PR and marketing. And you can tell also the setting is Chicago uh, from the cover, which I think is nice. Do you, um, but go ahead. Sure. One thing that we like to say about the book, because like you, you'll see it is women's fiction and romance, that, you know, one thing we say is that we really set out to write the book that we wanted to read that may not fit squarely in, in a genre, but there's sisterhood vibes, summer in the city, um, self-growth. And um, while it's a story about two sisters, each one does have a romance. So there are two steamy love interests, which are, are love stories, I guess. Yes. And um, as we're going to find out later, the first book has some commonality with this one. It's also about sisters, half sisters, if I remember correctly. It's not the same setting, but it's also kind of a beachy uh, read. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, this particular clinic uh, arose when I uh, was in conversation with Allison at a recent writing conference. This was the Women's Fiction Writing Association Conference. And we were talking about publicists and hiring one. And uh, it basically boils down to the following. Uh, I have questions about what writers can do to help be their, I, I put in that typo, uh, what writers can do to help their books be successful and what when it's smart to spend time and money on and what isn't worth the effort. And we've already made the decision to hire outside PR, Kathleen Carter. So before we get into what's smart and what's not, I think it would help lay the foundation here uh, for you to talk about how your publisher has supported you in the past, whether that's marketing wise or publicity wise. And we will talk about the differences here and then what they're planning for your next book. And since you both have like your own careers and then your joint authorship career, uh, I consider it fair game, any, any of your experiences, what you've experienced um, as support on your own or in co-authorship. And how about uh, Allison, you wanna go first? Sure. And you know, it's interesting because I've it's a question that a lot of people get and for myself, I, when, it, when I was deciding to, to make the decision to hire outside, because I've hired outside publicity for all of my, my two solo books and then Brady and I together for this, the real reason that it came down to is that I would rather regret 
having spent the money than wish I had. Um, you know, it is so hard for a book to make a splash in the world. And I just wanted, because I was in a position that I could afford to, I wanted to give it the best shot. So it's interesting because I don't really know what the publicity marketing would have done if they didn't have the support. One thing with every publicist that I've hired, I've made sure that they work um, in tandem with the with the com with the publishing company because I don't want to, you know, I didn't want to be at odds. And and the first time for my first book, the um, the publicist was like, "You don't have to do this," and I was like, "I know I don't have to." Um, and they, you know, made me feel like they were going to give it their all. Of course, the pandemic happened, so who knows what what would have eventually happened. But for that one. I wanted to, um, I worked with a company who had like a summer reading challenge and I wanted to get their audience. So really it was just to get the most eyes and the most support and give the book the best chance. But the internal publicity and marketing company, marketing people really did work in tandem and they did things together, but it did feel like, and Brady, curious your thoughts too. It did feel like they, the internal group didn't have to do as much because our outside publicist was, you know, being paid by us to do those things. Yes, I agree. I think our publisher, I mean, they set up a lot of the things like, you know, Facebook giveaways and the Goodreads giveaways and um, placement in like newsletters, um, like the publishers, I can't remember, we publishers like weekly roundups of like summer reads and things like that. So that they did a lot of that type of placement for us that an outside publicist doesn't really have access to. So you're saying that your publisher had these media connections mm -hmm. and your internal publisher publicist had those connections that got you on those reading lists. Great, okay. And how much insight do you have currently about what they're gonna do for Comeback Summer? You know, it's interesting. A lot of publicists and, and publishing companies I found out don't really tell you until something's official. Um, I did work with one publicity partner who told me everything. Like I knew who they had pitched it to. I know who passed. I know who said yes. I'm somebody who likes information. So like, I love knowing that, but it's really an anxiety slash waiting, waiting game. Like, you know, that they're working, but a lot of times they don't tell you until there's, there's a bite. We've heard that people are, seem interested. Um, they're definitely doing a lot of focus on the Chicago connection because the books that takes place in Chicago. Um, but a lot of it, like they say, they're shooting for the moon and we're just crossing our fingers that, that it lands. Yeah. Now for the first book, you had a tour. I think it was main. I don't know if it was mostly virtual at that point or not. Um, but there were a lot of stops on it. Is there something comparable happening this happening this time? Our last book, we did sort of a two week tour and hit a bunch of spots and it was um, mostly in person. We did do okay. several virtual events. And for this one, I think we're going to do a slightly shorter tour and try to hit the spots that maybe about a week. And then we have a few other events sort of scattered throughout the summer, trying to keep the momentum going for the summer. Okay. And for that tour that happened for the first book, was that planned by you and the publicist you hired or the publisher or both? That was, um, we worked with, with Kathleen to do that. So, and we're, um, we have a call this afternoon with her to, to plan, um, for the, for the next tour, but we kind of told her the cities that we wanted to go to and she was able to coordinate and, um, you know, get everything, everything set up and moving, which was really great. Cause Brady and I both have, um, full-time jobs as well. And so, um, just having somebody that, that could help. And also it, it felt a little bit more, um, just a little bit more professional to have, or like to be taken seriously to have a publicist call a bookstore on our behalf versus having us call. Um, so it was really, really helpful for her to do a lot of the legwork and, um, you know, making some of those connections for us. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So um, Jenny is wondering in the chat, when you went on tour, were they to towns that you already had connections with? And also were the events well attended? It was sort of a combination. Um, we went to several cities that we had connections, like our hometowns and other places where we have lived, but there were a few that we had never been to, um, but especially bookstores that are sort of have a track record of doing events that bring in a lot of people, especially ticketed events. We tried to hit a few of those, and those are really nice because the, the bookstore is putting forth a lot of effort to get people there um, to see you. Yeah, those were, honestly, those were some of my favorite events. Like, you know, we 
we almost, because this was our debut, we had almost like a party in some cities, but the events where we were more in conversation and it was traditional was were amazing. Um, Majors and Quinn in Minnesota, like that was our first stop. And the fact that there were people there that we didn't know was like incredible. Um, M. Judson in um, in Greenville and Litchfield Books in, in Polly's Island, both of them are are bookstores that have, a, like Rick Brady was saying, regular events that trusted readers come to. And so it was incredible to meet people that, you know, may not have heard of us or our book, but trusted the bookstore. Mm -hmm. So did Kathleen already know that those were the good stores to go to? I imagine so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so just for some education for people who may be very new to this topic, I thought I would set out you know, some baseline expectations for what publishers might do if they take the time. Like there are no promises here about what your publisher is gonna do. It's gonna vary book to book and publisher to publisher, but there is a difference between marketing and publicity. Usually the marketing team is uh, these are the people who place advertising, who do online promotions, uh, they handle giveaways. Like if you want to do Instagram giveaways, which I know you both do, you know, they're usually helping facilitate that. Um, they do uh, in-store merchandising and promotions, influencer marketing, book club marketing, email marketing, uh, if you want swag, uh, if there's a pre-order campaign, all of those things tend to fall under marketing. Uh, kind of a shorthand way to think about marketing versus publicity is that marketing is the stuff that you have to pay for or make an investment in. And then publicity is the stuff that you get for free in terms of media coverage, and you have to be pitching the media for that coverage. Um, the publisher's marketing team is also responsible for things like metadata, which sounds boring, but can be really important for online discoverability um, and your marketing copy. Uh, and also if that copy has to be refreshed or updated over time at the retailers, or if it needs to be massaged for certain groups of readers, um, that's what the marketing team does. And then the publicists tend to focus on the media coverage, um, like getting the book in roundups, for example. Um, and then they might also be helping with author events and tours. Uh, is there anything that you two wanted to add to this list? I think that's good. I think that, yeah, I think that sounds good. I do think that the 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 world is changing so much that the line kind of gets blurred a little bit. Yes. And so I think that there's some marketing that publicists do and there's some yes. publicity that marketing does. So um, we ask a lot. And I think that, you know, it's uh, I found that it's OK to ask. No yes. one gets offended. Yes, absolutely. Um, Yvonne's asking in the Q&A if the publicist uh, or your publishing editor will help you get your essays or articles related to your book in major outlets. And that is generally under the purview of uh, the publicity department. But I find that authors often do that themselves, especially if they already have an established relationship with the outlet. Um, did either of you place articles or essays related to your book that you wrote yourself? Yeah, for both. And I think that, um, and I've had both happen. Like I, um, for my solo stuff, I had some through connections that I had, and then the um, the publicist, I don't remember if it was internal or the external, um, placed them. And then Brady, I, do you remember who did, who placed the ones that we wrote for the beach trap? I think Kathleen did. I think she okay. did. But they work together and, and um, you know, they're pretty um, collaborative about it, which is great. Yeah. Uh, there's a pretty important question that's come through um, from JM. It, uh, will a publicist not be very helpful for a self-published author? Um, and then Wayne is also asking if there's no marketing team because there's no publisher because the book is self-published. Do independent publicists do some of the marketing stuff? Um, I'll just say here for self-published authors, I think it's usually not helpful to hire a publicist if they're a publicist in the traditional sense of trying to pitch the media because the media is very tough to get uh, it's tough to get a self-published book uh, into their coverage into their pages sometimes they even have a policy so it's I would say you're probably looking at more at hiring a marketer who could help with other things like deciding how to advertise or if you should advertise or how to run a pre-order campaign, if that would make sense for your book. Um, I know that there's a lot of confusion around 
like the the term publicist and like hiring a marketer, like those two terms get conflated. And as you both pointed out, you know, there are people who do both. So it's really important if you're going out to hire that you understand what that person is, what, where their specialty or expertise is. And if you're really looking for publicity, meaning like media coverage, or if you're looking for marketing, or if you're looking for both. Um, so I think we've sort of covered what hi your hired publicists have done for you. They've helped, uh, helped you set up tours, uh, bookstore events. Um, they helped you place pieces. Uh, what else have they helped you do? I will give a plug for um, Anne-Marie Nieves with Get Red PR. She does, um, she did publicity for me for my second book. And she also has somebody that she works with for marketing. So I worked with her to do some publicity and marketing. So um, that was nice that she did both. Great. Um, I'm trying to think what else the publicists have done. Um, I mean, they set up podcast interviews for us. There's a question on podcasts. That's another yeah. thing. Um, I mean, blog tours, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, also they helped like get, help us, um, brainstorm and get blurbs. Um, yes, that's another great one. And so let's, have, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say sometimes blurbs get used and that term gets used in different ways. So you're talking about advanced praise, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Advanced praise. So the, the quotes that go on the cover or the back cover of the book that say you're brilliant. <laughs> yes, <laughs> hopefully. Um, there are a lot of questions about uh, like, can a publicist help with this? Can a publicist help with that? Can they help with podcasts, uh, et cetera? And usually they can help with just about everything. It's just, you know, it's mainly about deciding what is it that you need help with? What would you like them to focus on? And which is of course, we're going to talk about today. And I think uh, the, the other thing that seemed to be the difference between the like internal and external from what I've understood is that the internal publicist works for the publishing company and they may have like six or seven authors or they have like a lot of books that they're responsible for. But like Kathleen, like we pay her, like she works for us and for our right. book. She has other clients also, but it just, um, and that's not to say anything like less than glowing about the internal people, but it's nice just to know that there's somebody that's, that is, you know, working for you and your book. Yes. yes, it's much easier to direct her. Like, we want you to do this, this, and that because we are paying her. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, exactly. I know. I know that internal publicists often, uh, those who are honest, say, you know, I'm not working for you, the author. I'm working for the publishing company, and I do what they tell me to do. <laughs> right. Uh, and it's it's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, Patty is asking in the chat about the timeline and when you bring someone on board, whether that's a publicist or a marketing firm. And I know that most publicists I talk to like to be brought in up to a year in advance. And I think it can be really hard to bring them in. Let's say, I was, let, shocked. I was yeah. shocked this time yeah. at how early, because we were in, and we had a lot of, a couple of happy accidents happen with ours where um, we actually thought it was a typo in the contract. Um, the beach trap was supposed to come out this summer, but they decided to push it up a summer. And so like, we were like, oh goodness, like we hadn't even finished writing the book yet. And I think we were like seven or eight months out. And most of the publicists that we reached out to were already booked. Um, and Kathleen was already booked, but ended up somebody, one of her clients, the pub date moved and we're like, okay, we'll take it. Yes. But it, it um, they fill up and it's, you know, I think it's a good thing that they limit the number of authors that they take on just because, you know, they're able to, to give um, all that time and effort, but they do fill up pretty quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think the earlier you reach out, the better. And if you're right at the moment of the book releasing, it's probably too late for what I would consider a launch campaign, mm -hmm. but maybe there are some things that you could do that, you know, are more marketing related about, you know, spreading the word that, not necessarily tied to the launch, but something that could be ongoing. All right. So I just want to kind of summarize quickly what hired publicists tend to excel at. So they can collaborate with you on big picture campaign ideas. I think that's one of the best reasons actually to hire one. Cause I, I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's really hard to just think by myself about something and be creative. Like I like having a sounding board and throwing some ideas around. And I think they can be really great at that. Plus they've experienced so many other clients and campaigns and they can draw on, you know, some of that too. Um, I think most people think about publicists in terms of pitching the media and obviously 
if that's what you want, they should have some established media connections and a track record there. They can assist, assist with the events, the tours. Um, copywriting, I think, is something often not thought about, but copywriting would be anything that you write to market and promote your book, whether that's on your website or uh, in related to social media or any sort of campaign materials that you might be generating or sending out um, to media outlets. I think some of them will do social media guidance. Uh, they might work with you on brand building or platform building, like helping you with the email newsletter, those sorts of things. But that's where we start to get into marketing and um, like ongoing things that may or may not be related to the book. Uh, did your publicist help you with any of those last two things, like social media and so email newsletters or any of that? They created some artwork for us that we could use. Um, I worked with um, two of the companies that I worked with. Um, the independent ones created a lot of social assets. They created like artwork from blurbs and and you know promotional materials. Um, Kathleen doesn't do that, but Berkeley does such a great job at it right. that it's okay. Yeah. Um, so I have found that even within the publicists, they you know because she's a solo versus some have like a bigger a bigger staff that um, that help with that. Um, but I feel like she's done a lot with like, you know, sending out books to people on Instagram, Instagram influencers, even TikTokers and, and things like that. So that's a big thing that, that they help with. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So now I want to kind of switch to looking at it from what authors do often from a marketing and publicity standpoint, where I think it's really hard to outsource these things. Um, you guys can tell me if you think I'm right or wrong about this. But especially when it comes to the like inner circle, like the people that you know really well, the people in your own community, I think you tend to get better results when it's you reaching out um, and making the ask or looking for the collaboration. So this could be like if you have your own email newsletter and your readers are following you there or they follow you on your Facebook group. Um, if you were going to organize a street team effort, um, you know, readers like you, usually they're going to do what you ask, if you ask in a nice way, um, any sort of community support. So I know that, I know at least you, Allison, are part of the Women's Fiction Writers Association um, or have some contacts there. Are, are you, either of you in the tall poppies? No, we've got yeah. a lot of friends that are, but we're not in it. Okay. But any sort of group writing genre related group, that would be also, I think, a first stop for any author. Um, and then just family, friends, your networks, like those are all, I think often they're overlooked because people think national first rather than looking to their own backyard first, but the backyard is really important. <laughs> Things yeah. often ripple out from that inner circle. So um, do you guys have any comment or insights on this one? I think just like you said, whatever is in your network, Allison and I sort of have different networks. And so it's been nice that we've both been able to um, sort of build off of that. Like Allison had had two books come out before our book came out together. So she had a lot of, um, a lot of author network. And then I had been really active on Instagram with like bookstagrammers. And so I had a lot of people on Instagram that I was very connected with. So that sort of balanced each other out. Yeah. And I, I do think that reaching out to fellow authors, um, the publicist and publishing company can also help with that because, you know, they have like, you know, or, or even if you have an agent, like my agent has connections with other authors or other editors who have represent authors. And so they can help. Um, the, the other thing that I, that I would add that I think is so, so important is like, if you're going to get a lot of support from your community, but you also have to give support back. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it is a very reciprocal thing. And um, even before you're published, people notice when other people are supporting other authors. So I think that it's really like that community has been incredible. Um, and it is something that would be hard to outsource, but it's it's definitely um, a give and take there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about strategy versus execution. Um Something I learned long ago, for better or worse, I, I want to say this was around 2014, 2015, I was speaking with a, a professional marketer who was teaching classes to authors on marketing and publicity, and he said, what I've learned is that no one wants to talk strategy, everyone wants tactics. 
<laughs> so like, here's what to post on your Facebook page at 3 p.m. Um, or yeah, here's exactly how to write the subject line of your email newsletter, or here's how many times to post on Twitter in a seven day window. And then you just execute, 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 execute. Um, and it's not that he, um, what, what I want to say. So he shared all of these tactics and he had to be very, he had to go very light on the strategy because people just zoned out. But strategy is everything, right? So when he told me that, it, I, I felt deflated because <laughs> I'm such a strategy person. Um, so there's this article that I'm going to quote from, and I encourage everyone to go read this article because it has like life changing implications far beyond marketing and publicity. Uh, so pardon me for getting a little philosophical for a moment. As a general rule, we're a great deal better at execution than at strategy. We appear to have an innate energy for working through obstacles to our goals and an equally innate resistance to pausing to understand what these goals should rightly be. We seem to be as lackadaisical about strategy as we are assiduous about execution. We prefer, we prefer to zero in on the mechanics, on the means and the tools, rather than on the guiding question of ends. We are almost allergic to large first order inquiries. What are we ultimately trying to do here? What would best serve our happiness? Why should we bother? How is this aligned with real value? Uh, and if you go and Google School of Life on strategic thinking, you'll find the full article, which is well worth your time. So. Now that I've said this, I want to go back to the challenge that was first stated at the outset. And so the questions this raises for me is, well, what defines success for you for this book or at this moment in time in your career? Because that's just as important how this book might be a stepping stone to some other things. And also what would make you happy, which is very, very important. Um, and so what's smart and what's not is really, I feel, depends on the answer to these questions. So I do have a slide coming up next that's specifically about, okay, if you wanted me to tell you what's hot right now, I will tell you. But I also want to know what would make you happy. Like what, what, so what, do you, what outcome would you like to see, aside from selling lots and lots of books, um, for the comeback summer? We talk about this all the time. Like it is something that we talk so much about because it success is such an ambiguous thing and it can change so much. And and we're both really good at, well, I'll say Brady is good at keeping me grounded um, because of course we want, like we would love to hit a bestseller list. We would love to have like, you know, millions of readers and and we'd love to, to have that, like that level of success. Um, but we don't have control over that. And so we try really hard to have our success be what we can control. Um, I will tell you when I, like some of the things that make me feel like we were a success is when we get letters or messages from readers who say that something really resonated with them or they saw an experience that they could relate to in the book. Um, and I, I know I read reviews, I, Brady doesn't, but I love when like hearing how people, how the book resonates with people. But I think that and I don't, I don't know if there's, if I have like a tangible what success is, I just want to do everything that I can to get the book into more people's hands. And I know like, to me, it's not as much, it, sales of course has something to do with it, but also the discoverability and um, just having people give us a chance. Brady, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with all of that. I mean, I think there's sort of like philosophical things to go into about what means what it means to be successful as an author. But a, like a big milestone that we wanted was to get another book deal like that. We just wanted to be able to keep writing and we did. So that was that's a big check to say, OK, now we have we get to write two more books. So we'll have four books contracted with them in total. And hopefully we get more after that. So <laughs> and I think, you know, one thing and Jane, I think we might have even talked about this at our at the at the retreat is that, you know, just knowing that I think it's like less than 1% of books sell 5,000 copies um, a year that come out. But even within that 5,000 copies, if you're, if you sell 5,000 copies, you still might not be considered a success by the publisher. Right. And I think that there's such a difference between like what success feels like for us. And somebody made a comment about like spending our money and like the money we make versus the money that the publisher makes. We talk about that a lot too. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a conundrum because different people have different measures of success, but like Brady said, like we just got another two book deal. So 
we are thrilled that Berkeley and Penguin Random House think that our first book was a, a success enough that they're letting us do it again. Yeah, that's, I think that's a really nice goal to have, which you have now already reached. So that's, that's excellent. Um, so I, I guess, well, we'll, we'll, I have some more, we'll dive into some more of the specifics here as we go. Um, I just want to say, for the benefit of everyone listening, as well as you two, if you were going to focus on what's hot right now, I mean, everyone is focused on email based marketing, whether that's um, organic paid or something that you own yourself. So for instance, if you had an email newsletter, I would be telling you to use it to its utmost potential. Um, BookBub ads, which go out through email, which your uh, publisher might be making use of at some point for either the first book, or actually, why don't I pause there and ask, do you know if they're planning to run any promotions for that first book through BookBub or Goodreads or other places? Because that's often done like in the month or two prior to the next book's release to gin up more sales. So we asked about that. And I think by the time we asked about it, we had missed the deadline for the month before. I know. But I think that they are going to, they applied for it because I know it's not like up to them. But I think they applied for it to get a book bub um, it, the month it comes out. So, um, but I, I had the same thought, like, let's get more readers hooked. And then um, hopefully they'll discover the second book too. Yes. Um, the other thing you could consider doing on your own or with your with Kathleen is looking at uh, the click based ads that appear in BookBub that it's not the featured deal, it's not the main event, but it's the stuff that appears below the main event. And that can also be effective if you target it correctly. And I actually have an article that's going to be published next week on this topic and I'll send it to you both so you can take a look and decide is this something that we want to do. Um, and it could be done at any time. It wouldn't have to be done prior to release. Um, okay, so the other thing, oh, the other email opportunities I wanted to mention is that Ingram is now uh, firing up its email engines and they now have email marketing as does Open Road. So Open Road Media is a publisher, but also a marketing service. So they have uh, email marketing to support new releases as well as backlist. So that's something else where you could potentially nudge your publisher, or you could even, they might even take authors on. So another, if, if you wanted to go down the email path, not saying you should, those are probably the main players. Um, BookTok, I mean, BookTok's been pushing sales uh, for, for all types of books, especially in romance for the last few years. Now, are either of you using it or engaging with it at this point? I spent an hour scrolling on TikTok this morning. <laughs> yeah, not not super great. Um, I think that's an area that feels challenging to us right now. I think. <laughs> yeah, and they're they're sending it to book talkers, um, and you know, like, but yeah, it's a, uh, it feels like, you know, everybody wants to go viral, so it feels a little bit like a, you know, uh, just hoping for it. <laughs> right. Right. Um, well, I don't recommend that you go jump on TikTok for the sake of this book, but if you were already there and engaged, then it would make sense to just ramp up that activity. Mm -hmm. um, and then influencer partnerships, not just on TikTok, but uh, of any kind, wherever that might be. Uh, here, I'm thinking specifically of like Chicago, because that's where the book is set. And that's usually where, you know, things like things related to the book's themes, uh, settings, um, occupations, all of those things can lead to partnerships. Now so, that, oh, go ahead. So two, two questions, if it's okay. Um, cause for, for my second book, my second solo book, I think I did a lot of like, I was again, just like, I felt like I was throwing spaghetti at the wall and I, I tried to sign up for, I paid for a lot of the email marketing and things like that. And I know BookBub is big. How do you recommend knowing like what is like which ones to do or if it's like how much money it's worth spending and it may not be an easy answer but um it, there seems to be a lot of e like book um sale and ad messaging and like I believe actually when I did it for my second book it was when there was a book bub so it was not like on launch but it was when there was a sale to try and get um more eyes on it so the question is 
as far as email advertising, what are the best vehicles? Is or that, is it worth worth doing it for launch or is it worth when it's like more are more of them deal based and waiting to do it when there's like a sale or a book bub? Yeah. With book bub, I mean that particular audience that they've captured is very discount and deal driven. So I think it would be really hard for you to do a a strong first campaign there with the click based ads, unless it were a discounter deal, let's say on the first book. Uh -huh. Now they do have um, targeted emails to like the people who follow you for new releases. Do you happen to know off the top of your head how many people follow you on BookBub, either of you? Not enough. So if everyone here wants to follow us, I <laughs> so appreciate it. <laughs> so that's the only vehicle, advertising vehicle they have where okay. I would say, yeah, take advantage of it, but you, it, you would have to have a pretty meaningful number of people following you there for it to make sense. Um, certainly you can advertise, you know, uh, full price eBooks in those click-based ads, but I think you would end up losing money and there might be better opportunities elsewhere. So you could look at, um, like if you were able to work with, um, an Ingram or an open road, and this would probably be through your publisher. I think that could be very interesting and useful, but BookBub is so discount driven. I don't, I would hesitate. Um, do you went with the first book? Did it, I'm trying to, I don't recall what the ebook price on it was. Do you remember what it is? I think it's 9.99. Yeah. Okay. So that's pretty high for, for BookBub. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know if it's ever been discounted as of yet? Mm -hmm. It has not yeah. yet, but we, yeah, sorry. Okay. So definitely once it is discounted, that's, you know, you, you want to like blanket every possible corner of the earth uh, with messaging when that happens. And hopefully your publisher will alert you when and if they do that discount before it happens. So you can be prepared. I, I for my other books, like I get emails from readers that tell me that like my book is on sale. Like it is, it is. <laughs> It's crazy how um, you'd think they would let you know that, but a lot of the times I stumble upon it after the fact. <laughs> uh, Dawn's wondering if book bub is more for fiction than nonfiction. It is definitely known and mostly used for fiction, but they have really solid nonfiction lists too. So if you're in a commercial nonfiction category, I would definitely consider it. And by that, I mean like business, self-help, self-improvement, uh, cooking, those types of like really popular categories. Okay, so this, I want to kind of like, we've gotten really granular here with a few specific tactics. Um, I want to pull out and just talk more strategy for the moment about all of the different things that you could potentially do. And that I would hope that, you know, you have a conversation with Kathleen about these different areas. So we talked before about marketing and publicity and how marketing is the stuff you pay for and publicity is what um, you know you get for free sort of. Um, I like thinking of it in a little bit of a different way because there is a lot of overlap. I like thinking about earned media, shared media and owned media. So earned media is the media that you earn like when you get your reviews or media coverage. So publicists work really hard to get you the earned media. Then there's shared media where you have like influencer partnerships or sponsors or, you know, the city of Chicago, you know, does something to promote your book. Uh, and maybe there's some pay for play there. Owned media is the stuff that you guys own and control yourself that's not dependent on someone else cooperating. It's not dependent on your publisher. Um, but it would also, in this case, include any of your publisher's owned media. So your publisher's own Twitter and Instagram accounts, for example. So this would include your social media, email lists, groups that you have, uh, any content, podcasts, et cetera. And in each of these areas, there are paid opportunities um, but we could also just break out another bubble and say paid media, but I think it makes more sense to think about it as subsets of each of these three. Um, is there one of these areas where you feel like, gosh, this has been a weakness or we don't feel like we've exploited this to its full effect, or do you feel an affinity for any of these particular areas? And we'll start with Brady this time. 
Um, as far as an affinity, I think we are pretty good on Instagram. I mean, we were at the Savannah Book Festival last weekend and we had so many people, authors and readers just say, oh, your book was all over Instagram. So I think that worked really well. The book cover was really vibrant and I think it just fit Instagram really well. I don't think it did as well on um, TikTok. Um, owned media, I mean, I think that's something we can work on. Allison, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. And I think um, Brady actually had a really good idea for this book that we're doing because we our, our runway was shortened. They um, they pushed the date up a month, which we were super excited about because it is like a summer book. So it'll be on, on the shelves for more of summer. Um, but our the time that we had to promote it was less. So Brady had a really great idea um, of doing the Sisterhood of the Traveling Ark. So running a giveaway where, where we're having people Brady, you, you came up with it. Do you want to talk about it? Sure. It's just a traveling advanced copy. So we post it on our joint um, social and our, also our individual ones because we each have individual ones, people who are interested in getting an advanced copy and then reading it and sending it on to someone in their network. So hopefully reaching, we, we wanted to do it that way to reach out of our own network. So like our little bubble that we could find um, ways to sort of broaden that reach a little bit. And I think as far as what we like, you know, would like more work on, I think the earned, like, I think that, that it's just so hard to get media to pay attention to you. Yes. And even yeah. when you do get coverage, it's like how many eyes are on it. Like, I know that a lot of publications have cut or limited what they do on books. And so actually my brain started going when you started talking about influencers, like not book influencers, but Chicago influencers, yes. or help influencers yes. or people that like not just talk about books, but talk about something specific. So I like my brain's going off there thinking about just some of the topics that we cover in the book that might, we might be able to find someone who doesn't always just talk about books. Right. And gosh, let me encourage you more in that direction for all yeah. of the reasons that you stated, because there are dwindling outlets for book specific reviews and coverage. It's exceptionally competitive and it's not that you shouldn't try, it's just that there are other opportunities that might be so much easier to take yeah. advantage of, like finding someone in Chicago who's not books 24 seven, but would be interested in a book as part of the other things that they recommend. Yeah. So yes, more of that, I would suggest. <laughs> okay. So back to a little bit of, um, what uh, reality about marketing and publicity and what to expect. Um, this message is mainly for everyone listening um, rather than you and Brady and Allison in particular. But I, I find that some people will hire publicists or marketing firms thinking that they're going to get a one on one return for their dollar. Like you put in a dollar and you get out a dollar in book sales and it just doesn't work that way. Um, and certainly publicists, the good ones anyway, make it exceptionally clear. Look, I can't promise anything. I can't promise sales. And all of marketing and promotion, it's not limited to the book publishing industry. It's like poker uh, rather than a gumball machine. Um, you're not, for your 25 cents, you're not always gonna get a gumball out. You may get nothing or you may get five gumballs. So. There's a lot of trial and error and experimentation that goes into it. Um, especially with advertising, you'll hear a phrase repeated, small bets, take lots of small bets. And then when you find something that works, you double down on it. And so I think the, that metaphor is very apt for marketing and promotion of books. Now, I was at a really fascinating panel just a couple weekends ago. This was at the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. I wish everyone who was listening could have been there because it was just fabulous. It was something called the Piranha Pit, which sounds bad, like it would be really stressful, <laughs> but it was a panel of three um, publishing experts. Now, one was a, from a publishing company, one was, a, I think, an agent, another was a marketer. And a series of six or seven authors who already had books out for years, in some cases, were pitching the panel to convince them that their marketing plan deserved investment. Mm -hmm. And the prize for the winner was $1,000 to for them to use for their marketing plan, which is really not much at all, I have to say, but still. So the authors came up to the podium to do their pitch. Um, and they were selected in advance. Um, so by default, they were probably better than the huge group that initially applied for Piranha Pit. But it was just so impressive to see these ideas um, 
for how they were going to continue marketing their book after release. And I think the one that impressed me the most uh, was an author who was doing a children's picture book uh, called Avocado Mustache. And you can go find this on Amazon right now if you wanted. And she self-published it. And she knew from the outset she wasn't going to get that book in bookstores or libraries. It was just, it, you know, it's like hitting your head against the wall to try to get into those traditional places with a self-published book. So her pitch was, help me reach the little baby boutiques of which there are X number uh, that I've already had success with. And so she was just, I loved her specificity and discipline in who she wanted to reach. And she offered some, some indicators of why she was going to be successful in, in getting these boutiques to take the book. Um, and here I have a picture of a baby boutique, of course, to remind me of what I'm talking about. So the specificity and discipline I, I have found is really key in some of the authors I've observed do their own marketing or bring in people to help them with that marketing. Uh, another example I'll use, this is um, Catherine Bob McGuire. This is nonfiction where she did have someone who helped her with publicity and pitching. She was able to get a piece that she wrote into the Wall Street Journal about her book about Edgar Allan Poe. And thereafter, she was also uh, on a Reddit, Ask Me Anything, uh, talking about the book. And when I spoke with her about the outcome of these two efforts, it was the Ask Me Anything that had the much bigger effect. And the reason I think I think is obvious. Um, the Ask Me Anything was just more targeted to the audience that was more likely to buy, whereas the Wall Street Journal was just, it was super broad. Um, but people, you know, there's a lot of prestige and status associated to appearing in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or whatever, but it was, it's these smaller niche focused places that tend to get the results. So that's another thing you have to think about in terms of the success that you want. You know, sometimes the status and prestige of saying, I've appeared in the Wall Street Journal can actually open up doors or maybe get it can get coverage from other outlets. Um, and so you use it in that manner. But the ask me anything, if she just wanted to reach the best audience for the book, that was actually better. Another example I have of this thinking is Jeffrey Ryan who did a memoir about his uh, Appalachian Trail odyssey. And he has this VW bus that he wrapped with images from him. And there's also his book cover on there. You don't see it in this picture, but it's on the van too. And he decided rather than, you know, try to get his book into bookstores, it's self-published by the way, or is it a small press? It's, it might be a small press. Rather than try and get the bookstore library market, he was like, I'm going to go to L.L. Bean stores and pitch them on events. And he did basically a tour of L.L. Bean stores across the country, just driving the van. And he sold out at most of the venues that he went to because it was such a targeted audience, people who were, you know, primed to be interested in this sort of book. And then the let's see this book which is a book about marketing. So we're getting very meta here. Uh, <laughs> I actually recommend this book highly for those who want a good, good training in marketing. It's called Traction. And they found after all of the efforts that they put out over the, because they're marketers, they tracked the effectiveness of every single thing that they did with tracking links. And they found that business podcasts were the best use of their time. And that makes sense. Uh, but sometimes people just, you know, they could have focused instead on, oh, I want to be in the Wall Street Journal or I want to, you know, be in Forbes. But they were like, nope, it's business podcasts. And that's what we're going to do from for the next six months. And then the example I always love pulling out because it goes against so many stereotypes we have about what book marketing looks like. Um, Merle is a client that I had who did a book called The Baby Decision. And, you know, she's, she is not young. <laughs> she's not really into internet marketing or social media or Reddit. In fact, she had never used Reddit before until she discovered a forum of people who have the problem that her book addresses, whether or not to have children. And so she got very engaged and involved on that Reddit, and it has become a huge part of her ongoing marketing. 
I often find, and I'd love to hear from you too, that when an author finds something that really works like this, they tend to repeat it and keep going back to it and it actually becomes more successful over time. Do you feel like you've found that at this point? The, you know, <laughs> no, yeah, I, but I do, think, I do think that like, the one thing about it is, is like, to me, that's important is being authentic. And like, we try really, really hard not to like, see some people like there's posts where it's like, I'm looking for a book that features two sisters and romance on a beach. And I really would want to be like, oh, our book, but it just feels like, it feels icky a little bit to be, to just kind of promote ourselves like that. Um, but I think that to me, the, the closest thing to that is just the connections and like the relationships with people in, that are readers. Um, and we genuinely enjoy that. We've met some incredible people, but as far as like a place or a thing or a platform, um, I think we're still waiting for that magic yeah. thing to strike. <laughs> Understood. All right, so this brings me back around more specifically, finally to your book. And I, you know, I was just going through a brainstorm of what might some indicators of success be for you or what might you focus on? What might make you happy? Putting myself in your shoes. Um, maybe you wanna be known and considered by every book club. And I'm not talking here about celebrity book clubs. I'm talking about, you know, library and bookstore book clubs. Or maybe you wanna be stocked in every beach resort boutique shop. Um, I actually knew an author, this has been ages ago, that did very good business selling on consignment at Sanibel Island. <laughs> like she sold hundreds of copies through a single boutique store because her book was set on Sanibel Island. So makes sense. Um, so that that there's the Chicago um, connection there to, to, but also your your books are beach books, right? So that strategy could maybe work. Or you want Chicago book lovers to know about your book, or you want all fans of Emily Henry to know about you. She came up as a comp. Um, I don't know if you know it, but your publisher is using her as a comp. Did you know that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Does that does that make you happy? Oh, I love it. Okay. <laughs> I um, one of the things, and Emily is incredible. We we know her and and love her books as like you know as a as an author and as a human. But with her book, Beach Read, like, I felt like she was like starting a plight to like, let people know that Michigan has beaches. And I feel like we're doing a similar thing with Chicago. Like, you don't have to be on the ocean to have a beach. So we're continuing her, um, her, her mission for that. Good, good. Um, and then the last point here, you want to reach young 20 something readers. So, you know, maybe you decide now is the year we're going to do TikTok, you know, since that's, it's generally can perceived as something for younger people. So, you know, looking at the, obviously this is a very limited list and we could go on and on, but does this spark anything for you? Is there something that you're gravitating toward? I think the Chicago angle is something that we've been brainstorming a lot. I mean, I feel like with the cover um, in any Chicago bookstore, this cover could be sort of right at the front um, during the summer. And I feel like it would be eye-catching and, and do pretty well. Okay. And I, also even think about, you know, because Chicago is not a place necessarily where there's like a resort, uh, like by the, by, you know, or, or that, that sort of thing. But I think like also places that sit, people that love Chicago that don't necessarily live in Chicago. Yes. Um, I think that book clubs are something that we love and um, don't always know how to, to reach because when you have a book club, you have a group of, you know, hopefully at least five up to 20 or even more readers who are going to read and, and actually read it and discuss it. So we love that. Um, and we've, we've joined in for like zoomed in for some Q and A's with some book clubs. Um, and again, just making those, those personal connections, I think is really great. Um, but I, we mention it all the time that we're happy to do it, but I don't know if there's ways to get, um, you know, book club consideration or to reach book clubs. Um, are you familiar with MJ Rose's author buzz marketing service? Um, I used her with, um, she is, works with, with, um, Anne Marie with get red PR. So oh, I used okay. MJ for that. Yeah. Okay. The, for book club marketing, I know that she has some packages that she uses like, uh, that reach out to people who reach out to book clubs. I don't, I don't know how effective it is, but it's the one that pops to mind as 
one place to go if you really wanted to try and do that, focus on that. And you yeah. had a, you have a reading guide in this book or it's a part of the supplementary yeah. resources? We do. Yeah. And it's, is it in the book? It's in yeah. the book. Okay. Something I would also suggest um, if you do go down the book club route is Amy Stewart did a really phenomenal session with Authors Guild on book club marketing. It's available on YouTube. I would watch that and take notes. She's, she's kind of mastered that method of outreach and it's really impressive. Mm -hmm. And she does some very simple things that are very effective, um, especially with her website and with her newsletter, with her business cards that, you know, they all mention, have me speak to your book club. Uh, you know, so she's always reiterating it again and again and again, and making it easy for people to understand. You can have me for your book club and that encourages more book club. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, mm -hmm. what's your opinion on, on essays? Like, you know, again, Brady and I both, both work and that's a thing that we talked about just that they take a lot of time and just not being sure if it's worth, if it's worth the effort and time that, that they take. I mean, in my experience, not so much, um, mm -hmm. unless it's really strongly, I think it can help more with nonfiction. Um, yeah. I, do, I think it's very difficult with novels. So I have seen people have success, especially like with how-to books, you know, running excerpts or doing spin-off articles and essays or memoir where you're like that really juicy scene, you know, and then people are like all caught up in it emotionally and then they get the book. Um, but with novels, I can't think of an example where I've seen essays really lead to major, uh, okay. major visibility. That was what we thought too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I want to just talk a little bit about how the last book was perceived by readers, which I, I think will be obvious to you both, but for the benefit of the audience, you know, it's a summer read, it's a beach read, it's fun. It's heartfelt. There's a sister relationship, which repeats uh, in this next book. Um, Parent Trap meets HGTV. I don't know if a reader came up with that or if it was something from your marketing people. Do you know? Was that I, Colleen Oakley? Colleen Oakley. Colleen Oakley said that. Okay. Yeah. Is she an author that? Yeah. Yeah. She blurbed us. Um, she's wonderful. Okay. Um, there's also, someone mentioned there's an influencer trope in there, but mm -hmm. tell me about that. So one of the one of the characters of the two sisters is a, like her job as a social media influencer, and she has a lot of growth throughout the book. But definitely, readers um, some take a while to warm up to her. But um, there's definitely an, an aspect of of social media and Instagram versus reality and and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and then when I was going through this, I noticed uh, some of the comps that were coming up and I grabbed these both from, I want to say Goodreads as well as Edelweiss. And for those who don't know what Edelweiss is, this is a, it's a platform that anyone can access, but it's targeted to bookstores and librarians and reviewers so they can see what books are coming up. And the great thing about Edelweiss, especially if you're an author, is that you can go on there and see what your publisher's saying about the marketing of your book. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and see who they're using as comps, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, have, have either of you done much in the way of looking at comps and thinking about how to steal, borrow, beg <laughs> from, from whatever they've been doing? Yeah, you know, and, and Brady, curious your thoughts on this, but I don't like, it's hard, to, a little hard to find like exact comps, which I think is okay. But that goes back to like the fact that we don't clearly fit on a shelf because, you know, and I think it's great because people who love women's fiction will find it and love it. People who love romance will find it and get a little bit more. Um, but I think I'm personally always looking at comps and, and what other authors are are doing. Um, you don't want to copy, but you want to maybe use it as as inspiration. Yes. Um, yeah. Brady, how about you? I agree 100% with all of that. So before we're getting here towards the end, um, and actually I should have reversed these two slides. I mean, what you have pr in progress now, as far as I can tell, is that you've got um, NetGalley and Edelweiss advanced review copies available for people to request. You've got some Instagram giveaways going. You're going to talk with Kathleen uh, later about other things that you might do. And so I feel like, you know, 
given what accomplished your goals last time, it sounds like the tour had some success. You're going to repeat elements of that. Um, are you starting to, is the picture becoming any clearer as to what you might do next, what the missed opportunities were, or what you, what some, what's the new thing that you might do that you just never thought of? Personally, I think my ear, my, I'm still thinking about what you said about thinking about different influencers. And, and um, we have a friend, Suzanne Park, who does a really good job at like looking at like at her Amazon numbers when they spike. And, and she had a point that she sees bigger spikes when they're not book related media or things where yeah. because book things are always talking, just always having books. So the, the different angles. So I, my, my brain is like kind of swirling for that. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Like, I think that we, I don't know if, I don't know. There's, there's so much, it's, it's a little overwhelming. I mean, I think one of the missed opportunities last time was the timing. Honestly, it's a summer book and it came out mid June, but for whatever yeah. reason, there was a delay in distributing. So the book wasn't stocked in many, many bookstores for two weeks. So it's a summer book and it wasn't really, really out there until July. I mean, I think just having this next one come out in May is going to be, make a big difference extending the season. Yeah. I do think one difference between what Berkeley did and what my other publishing company did was that they um, put some like heft between the, the pre-orders. Um, so they ran ads like on Facebook to try and get pre-orders. So I think that that was really good. Um, this time we're doing a pre-order giveaway that we'll hopefully be announcing soon. We did one last time too. And I think that was great because pre-orders are so helpful. Um, I don't know if readers know how helpful they are. And um, just to give people an incentive, because we're in such a, you know, on-demand instant gratification world that I think it's hard to get pre-orders. So I think that's something that we'd love to focus a little bit more on um, and just, yeah, keeping it going. I, I'm really excited that we're going to be on the shelves earlier. With the pre-orders, do you, what's uh, the situation with your email newsletters between the two of you? Do you have one for your shared name or yes? We do. We have, we, um, we each have solo ones, but we have one together. And um, the friends and fiction authors have been like, um, Kristen Harmel has been like a friend of mine for 20 years and they've been incredible and they've built such an amazing community. Um, so they included us in a, in a summer giveaway last year that was like all these big names and us. And there was like, it was amazing. And we got like quite a few um, through that. There was like a sign up. So um, we have a decent newsletter, but um, it don't have the best engagement on it and aren't super regular with it. Mm -hmm. Have you sent to that list at all about this book, upcoming yes. book? Yeah. We did for our cover reveal. Okay. And did you see much result from that? Um, I need to look again. I, that, that day I was like looking, there was a lot of opens. Um, we only lost 45 <laughs> subscribers, which I thought was pretty good. Um, but, um, I need to look back at it. It wasn't, did, we didn't get a ton of clicks. Um, but I'm also sensitive about not wanting to have it be too often or wanting it to be, you know, when we have something to say. Um, but I know, I believe before I've heard you say that we probably need to increase our, our frequency on that. Probably so. Yeah. But I definitely that's usually a missed opportunity for a lot of authors where, you know, they just haven't been consistent. And then when they do want to use it, they kind of feel a little anxious about amping up the frequency because their book's coming out because they know how yeah. that looks. <laughs> yeah. Which I understand. Um, I wanted to mention something I saw recently that may or may not be useful. Uh, are you familiar with the newsletter Shelf Awareness? Yes. Okay. The, their most successful ad in 2022 was a summer giveaway of like 12 different books. I don't think it's the same one you're talking about though, because this was placed by a publisher. Um, but it just made me wonder if, you know, the ship may have already sailed for your publisher on whether or not they're placing ads in shelf awareness, but that if, if you were able to do repeat a giveaway of some kind or collaborate on a giveaway related to summer reading, beach reads, et cetera, I think that's just kind of a no brainer. Um, yeah. However it appears, wherever it goes, I think. It well, and one of the things that you just gave me another idea, like one of the things that I love about panels and we were just talking to our friend with the Savannah book festival about panels is that 
like somebody might come for another author, but discover us. Yes. And so, and with our last book before our book even came out, we did some like Instagram lives or things, but maybe even pairing up with other authors who have books coming out around the same time and like, you know, using each other's audiences to introduce them to the other. That could be something to think about. And we're going to get to the Q&A here in a second, but just one last thought about Chicago. Are there are there events, su summer related events, beach related events, outdoor water events that I don't know if you would be an exhibitor or is there, is there any opportunities there in terms of the city based? Really good idea. Brady, do you want to come in town to that for the Old Town Art Fest? <laughs> We'll there's <laughs> there is a you know street festivals are a big thing in the city um yeah that's um in, that's a that's an interesting an interesting idea that's a really good idea okay thank you <laughs> of course of course uh let's see so we're to q a time um, before I go over to the question box here, I'll just mention there is another business clinic scheduled already for next month. Um, it's with Merle, who I mentioned is the author of The Baby Decision. We're going to be talking about choosing her next project. She is not a spring chicken. Uh, she, you know, she doesn't have that many projects left in her life. So we're going to talk about how you decide when time is short. Okay. So um, if either of you two see questions that you want to address or answer, feel free to just butt in at any point. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to look at the Q&A box and kind of go from the most upvotes down. Uh, question that I know is on everyone's mind, how do you find a good publicist in the first place? Uh, and how much does the genre of the book matter with the publicist? So let's tackle the first part. Um, I'll ask you, how did you find the publicists you've worked with? Was it word of mouth? How did you decide? I think, I think word a lot of mouth is a big one. Yeah, I, yeah. Just like we were saying, word of mouth is a big one. We made a list of people that we had heard of, our, our author friends had worked with. And I do think the genre matters. And we wanted a, a publicist who had worked with our specific imprint before. Um, because there's just some, you know, imprint specific things that we wanted her to know about. So. And I'm just uh, pulling up a resource that could be helpful for folks. Um, and it's just not coming up for me. And um, I also say that a lot of people are, are happy to, to talk with you. A lot of times, like when I've asked people about publicists, they say, let's talk just because it's like some of those things are better for a live conversation than, yes. than tech. But um, everybody that, that I've reached out to has always been happy to share their experience. Mm -hmm. I've just put a link into the chat. There is an industry uh, organization called Publishing Trends that put together a publicist cheat sheet. It's a very long list, but it, you could search it by keyword for your particular genre. It might help you get started. Um, but I would really, really recommend that you know you talk to at least a few places again well in advance and see who you seem to have good chemistry with. Uh, in addition to asking for recommendations from other people in the same genre as you. Uh, Sophia is wondering how can you use the second camp second book campaign to sell the first book? Uh, and she mentions one thing her publisher did was place a line in the front cover under the name award winning author of, you know, first book. Um, I did mention the the discount deals that tend to happen before the second book comes out. Um, and certainly you almost have to do nothing for the second book to sell the first one. It's just one of these halo effects that occurs that you get to enjoy. Um, but do you two have anything specific to share? Because I know you each have a number of books out. Um, I don't know. I, you know, and it's an interesting question because I think you're we're so focused on the 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 um, the the book that is releasing that that you know it's not like the other book isn't necessarily top of mind. But I do think that there's hopefully a um, just a halo effect that if people yes. like it. And I think, you know, another just interesting thing is, is I've noticed that a lot of authors find like the bigger success later in their careers um, when they have a couple, when they have more of a backlist so that when people discover a book, they can go back. But I don't know if it's a, if it's a focus. Yeah. 
uh, Tina's wondering about paid reviews. So this is where you pay like um, Kirkus or Book Life or Forward for a book review. She's wondering, you know, is it necessary to pay? As far as this conversation is concerned, we are not talking about paid book reviews at all. Uh, publishers, for the most part, do not pay for reviews. Um, if you're self-published, I think that's when the question becomes more uh, urgent because you feel like you might need them, especially for bookstores or libraries. I do have an article at my site that goes in into this, um, and I'm going to put the link into the chat here. By and large, I don't think they're worth it unless perhaps you're doing children's books, um, but you can read kind of the pros and cons in the article I've linked to there. I will say we get like all the time messages from people like wanting us to pay to place our book on their Instagram things and really all the time constant. yeah constantly Daily. or they say promote it on like hashtag and that it feels like spam and we ignore them all <laughs> yeah that's sad okay so that that's another <laughs> thing to watch out for folks is as soon as you get on any social media site you're probably going to get approached by people who want to take your money for book marketing and publicity also i found that self published authors will get approached by book fairs and marketing firms who promise to promote your book at book fairs and those are almost always a terrible horrible never good idea um yasmin's wondering uh if we're going to cover whether publicists will take on self published authors as well yasmin we mentioned that at the very beginning by and large you'll find firms might do that. But the question is, should you still invest in that? And I think you might be better off investing on the marketing side rather than the publicity side, um, especially if you think that will have long-term uh, value for future books that you publish. Um, I don't know, I want a question I have for the both of you. I once heard an author say, when they hired a publicist, they did it for the brand building and the platform building rather than for the book sales. And they found that it raised their profile to a new level going forward. So like they just had a better baseline to work from. And from that perspective, they thought it was worth the money they spent. So they weren't focused on book sales. That was, that was a big part of our discussion was we want to do this now because we want to build this brand of books set in the summer with sisters or female friends who have romances. Like that is our thing. And we want to do it every summer until we die. So, <laughs> but I think, but I think that, that it really is where it comes, comes into play to have a consistent publicist because your publishers publicity team can change every single book. So it's not necessarily consistent. Totally. And I think that, and I'm curious if that author was, if it was, that was their first book. Cause I think like, we're trying to have a brand like with our, the titles looking similar and the vibes being similar. So I think that, you know, we're not what we do. Of course we want to sell books, but we also want to build, like be we're th we think about it as building our brand. Yes. And I'll make this the last question since I know that, you know, you, you have a phone call with your publicist shortly. Um, <laughs> Susan asks, do you recommend a giveaway budget? And I know that with fiction in particular, especially in the romance area, giveaways are like a, like the number one thing that I think everyone does no matter what. So what do you say? I think giveaways can be really helpful. Absolutely. Um, I think with anything you do, you should set a budget on what you can afford. Um, and if you're getting, you know, if your publisher is sending you advanced copies and you're just paying for the shipping, that's, you know, relatively inexpensive, but it adds up very quickly if you're shipping out a lot of books. So, and like, say if like, and I know we've got a worldwide audience, but like specify where you are, because, you know, even shipping to Canada is like, you know, is expensive from here. Um, mm -hmm. But media mail is our friend. Um, if you're just sending a book, it's, um, it's an affordable way to ship. I don't, I haven't really thought about it as much as budget. I've thought about it more on a pacing level, like that you want to, to get people excited about it and enter. But if you're giving them away all the time, um, I don't know if you'll get less entries, but um, I think that giveaways, I, most of the time we've gotten, um, most of our email addresses that we've gotten have been from giveaways. So I think that you just want to make sure you're getting something from it other than just your, the eyes on it, I think. Yeah. Did your publishers do any Goodreads giveaways for you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They did. They did three the last time, and I think they're doing three this time. And they've also done the group giveaways, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think there's one that's on now, and there's a couple more coming where they 
pair us with, you know, with, with other authors and books to try and get um, more eyes on it. Mm-hmm. And have you found that useful? Do you see a nice result yourself? I don't know if we know. Yeah, (laughs) they don't share that with you. (laughs) That's one of the hard things. I think they sometimes will say how many like email subscribers we've got or things like that. Um, But yeah, it's hard to know. The Friends in Fiction one was like phenomenal. That was 13 books with like, again, a bunch of really big authors. Um, But um, yeah, it's really hard to know what works, which is, I think, where the part of the struggle comes in. Yeah. Like, we want to know what, you know, and I know that it's like poker, you know, you don't know, but um, we're, again, it feels a lot like throwing spaghetti at the wall, <laughs> seeing what sticks. And what about ebook giveaways? Is this something that you've done? Um, so I, um, I think that they've done that. One thing that reminds me that I did for my first two books when, um, when a book bub came up or the the book was on sale, I bought a ton myself. Like I bought like several, several copies, probably like 20 copies, hoping that it would make the numbers go up on the ranking, but I don't think it does until you download it. Um, but it, that gave me $1.99 copies that I could get use for giveaways or things like that. So um, that's something we may want to do, Brady, when we go on sale again. Absolutely. And uh, I'll just, uh, for those who are wondering how to facilitate an ebook giveaway on their own, I'll just mention book funnels are a really great tool, especially if you're a self-published author, if you want to build your email newsletter list, um, that's that's almost always the go-to for, for the digital giveaway. Okay, well, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Allison and Brady, for opening up about your experiences and what's worked or not worked and, you know, the general struggle and joy of going through this process. Thank you for having us. This was really yeah, fun. Thank and thanks so to everyone for watching. It's so cool. Uh, this session has been recorded. And if you would like to review it, all you have to do is go to my YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash at Jane Friedman. It'll be up there probably by tomorrow morning, if not sooner. So thank you all again. And I hope to see you at a future clinic. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.